Welcome back to another episode of the Pax What She Said podcast. It's always sweet to start your Monday with a victory Monday. And the Packers delivered in Tennessee, finishing now 2-1 and one for the fourth consecutive season. So really exciting for the Packers. And remarkably going 2-0 and oh with Malik Willis at the helm just in time for, it sounds like, Jordan Love to get back for a really hot divisional matchup next week at Lambeau. But Perry, this was... I will dive into it, but this was probably the Packers' most complete win of this the small season. Really short sample size, but just a really all around fantastic day for the offense, for the defense, and for special teams in Nashville. Yes, um, their highest scoring game of the season uh, by one point, but their first <laughs> thirty um, clean game, most dominant performance by the defense by far. This defense is starting to show us who we hope that they would be going into the season. Um, everybody got involved in this win, wide receivers, tight ends, running backs, quarterback. Um, never thought the most complete game would be with Malik Willis at the helm, but hey, NFL season is full of mysteries. Um, this team is off to a really hot start, and I kind of love that it's – doesn't matter like that Jordan love is down. I like, I think losing your quarterback for any length of time can like kind of mess with the headspace of, of a team. Um, and it seems like it's done the opposite for the green Bay Packers. I think that's a testament to Matt LaFleur. Um, he seems to be just like steering the ship, uh, as he always does. Um, so yeah, I totally agree. Uh, really amazing team win. And it goes to every phase as well. Special teams too. Even though, you know, Braden Arvidsson got bailed out on the missed 48 yarder. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I think that what's so significant about this win today is that when we we wrapped up the Colts win, we talked about in our preview of the Titans game that they were going to have to win differently because the Colts, mm -hmm. you know, you knew you were going to be able to run against them. Jeffrey Simmons this week, the soundbite was that nobody runs on the Titans. And it was, you know, pretty much true for the first couple weeks of the season. That defense was really stout. And we knew the Packers were going to have to let Malik air it out a little bit more, which he did. They got more involved in the passing game. And yeah, just the way that they ended the game, 5.1 yards a carry. They averaged 188 yards on the ground, which, you know, yes, Malik Willis had 73 of those, which is incredible. But you're still looking at over 100 yards for your running backs, which is a really nice day. 202 passing yards from Malik Willis finished with a rating of 120.9. Just a really phenomenal day of football for him. And noteworthy, too, that the Packers played a clean, clean football game. They were plus four in turnover yes. differential going into this game. The Titans were minus four. We said, if you make Will Levis make some mistakes, this is how you win the game. Just protect the football. And Malik has done, I think, even more than you could have asked from him, right? Like, if he threw one or two picks in the last couple of weeks, we'd be like, well, yeah, he's a backup quarterback in the NFL. But he has just far exceeded expectations and is so deserving of the praise that he's getting. And as much as he doesn't want to talk about it being a revenge game, and I believe him, I think that that helped. You know, Christian Watson talked about it. The guys in the locker room were just so excited for him to come out there mm -hmm. and get that opportunity and play as well as he did. Yeah. I mean, you made a few good points that I want to hit on. One being like, we knew the ground game was not going to be what it was last week. And you could see it immediately from the start of the game, right? It was just kind of inside zone was not working. They were running into walls and it was really just Malik making magic with his legs until Matt LaFleur decided to switch it up a little bit, get creative, get Jaden Reed involved, get Emmanuel Wilson involved, start trying to run the football in a bunch of different ways. They had a few, I think it looked like more designed runs for Malik rather than him um, going and using his legs um, when the opportunity arose, uh, when the plays broke down. Um, they definitely opened up the playbook for him more in this game. You could tell that last week they Matt was a little bit more hesitant, um, whereas this week it really feel, felt like they didn't hold back at all. He could throw when he felt like he needed to throw. He could follow run. He could run when he felt like it. There was there was a few moments that hit it for me. First, I want to point out was there was one moment where he did end up scrambling. It was clearly not a design run. Like the play broke down, but he you could watch him go through all of his reads 
There was mm-hmm. nobody there. And mm-hmm. then the lane was open and he decided to run. And I thought that was just such an amazing testament to like probably his development. Because if you watched him last season, two seasons ago, his um, comfortability was in using his legs. And maybe he would have just gone for it with his legs before even going through his reads. So he's clearly come such a long way. And because of that development, I think that's probably why they feel so comfortable opening up the playbook for him because they trust him. They trust that he's going to go through his reads and his progressions. And then he has this amazing ability to scramble, right? You said it already, 73 yards on the ground. Um, There was a third and 14 and also a third and 18. And he converted both of those um, to like deep shots that he just looked comfortable in the pocket. Mm -hmm. And Testament to the offensive line. I thought the offensive line, other than a few penalties um, in this game, looked really great blocking and pass protecting. Um, not like the most amazing defensive front to 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 the you know to their credit, but um, he just looked really comfortable back there and was converting some like major, major, major third downs. And again, like those are big moments for a backup quarterback to um, to have to make plays. Um, and not everyone is going to be able to do that. Even if your guys are open, you know, you, you never know if a bad quarterback is going to see the field appropriately. And so again, you just, you said it like Malik is doing everything right. Like he's just, he's doing everything right. And they're trusting him, um, to do it. You can see it in in what they were in what Matt was calling in this game. And I think, you know, obviously they settled for a field goal at the end of the half, but left a couple points on the board there. And yeah, it was, you know, stout Rundy in the red zone, but that was an opportunity for them to finish with seven instead of three. So there were points still available for this Packers team that put up 30 with Malik Willis. And I think that's, what's so impressive is just not only did he not make mistakes, but he was so careful with the ball. And it's not like there were any like Mm -hmm. tip drills that the defense missed anything like fell through their hands and the Packers got lucky. It was a really clean game of football from a turnover standpoint, um, from a penalty yeah. standpoint. I w- I think that is certainly an aspect that they'll need to clean up. But yeah, let's let's talk about the defensive side of the ball here as uh, our takeaways. Eight sacks for the defense. We talked oh about the pass rush getting home. Hadn't seen it against Jalen Hurts. Hadn't seen it against Anthony Richardson. Knew we would get to see it against Will Levis being less mobile. And the Packers deliver, and it's the most sacks in a game since 2005. So nice to see everybody getting involved there. And, of course, two interceptions, one returned for a pick six. Just all around really, really impressive day from Jeff Halfley's unit. Yeah, crazy. Um, You hit on it already, but just like we've been kind of waiting for the pass rush to make themselves known. And, you know, you knew there was a lot of containment happening in week one and week two and this was the week like if you're gonna show up you better show up and like my god did they show up um everyone got their numbers and um you had isaiah mcduffie with a half sack quay walker shared that sack you had Devonte wyatt with two who's having a really nice start to the season um preston smith who unfortunately actually negated a rashawn gary sack it could have been more um kingsley and Ibari had a JJ Anabari had a nice, nice, nice day. Yeah. Really nice day. Um, LVN also continues his development and ascent. Uh, just everyone having their moment. Um, Edge Cooper also got in on a sack. I just think everyone was playing um, up to standard for sure. I uh, I think Will Levis is going to need a really, really large ice bath in the morning. Um, but the highlight... The highlight of the day is Jair Alexander's first career pick six, like first career pick six. And you could see afterwards, you know, he kept the ball and how much that meant to him. But it was just also like it wasn't a gimme either. He read the route perfectly. I mean, Will Levis should have never thrown DeAndre the the ball there. Um, You could see Jair reading it perfectly, but just a smart move by a vet guy who finally gets one for himself. And I'm sure will is going to want it back um xavier mckinney three interceptions three games i'm sure we're all very happy that he is now a green bay packer so just a, a big day from this defense and um allowing malik too to capitalize on on those turnovers and those big plays which 
uh, I hope they continue to do for Jordan Love because if they do, then I think this Packers team is going to be like dropping 40 burgers every week. Yeah. One of the things I want to talk about, you know, we talked about kind of like the big overall takeaways, um, but I want to talk about some players that stood out because we've talked about guys that we wanted to see more fun. We've talked about players that, you know, are kind of ascending and, you know, Malik Willis got his flowers. I think he would count as a player that deserves to be talked about, but we've done that. Um, I want to talk about Eric Stokes because I know that, okay. you know, he, he gave up the touchdown kind of slipped. I didn't necessarily put that on him, even though, you know, if he keeps his footing, I think he's maybe able to shove Hopkins out of bounds at that point. Um, maybe at like the one yard line, but I think that he's, he's had like a quietly nice start to the season. And I know that Carrington Valentine was subbed in for him last week, but with Valentine not playing Stokes was out there the entire game. And I thought that he, you know, he hung in really nicely and uh, made some plays when he was, was out there. So I don't know what it'll look like when Valentine's healthy, but I just, mm -hmm. I thought that he was, he's having like a quietly nice start to the season that isn't necessarily showing up on the stats. You know, she doesn't have any picks yet, but is hanging with some receivers. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, they completely took away Calvin Ridley and Traylon Burks, um, both tight ends. Uh, the only player that really was able to do anything in this game was DeAndre Hopkins. Um, so yes, it, it's a testament to, um, both Eric Stokes and and I think Keyshawn Nixon as well, um, holding down holding on the slot in the middle of the field. Um, I think there's a lot of players to shout out in this game, and it might be um, an obvious one. I don't know. I mean, the entire offense looks so freaking good, but Tucker Craft, like he's in on every single play. Every play, I just feel like I see 85. I, I think I said this in the, in the Colts uh, recap show as well, but every play, it's 85 blocking. And I was, there was one specific play that stood out in my mind um, where he's clearly going to block and then he gets off his block and Malik gets him the ball and he, you know, tip, 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 tip toe up the sideline, um, you know, for a big gain. And those are the kind of plays that, really like make this offense run. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's very clear why he's playing like almost hundred percent of snaps and why he's in all the time and why he is, um, he's really like becoming kind of the engine, uh, in this offense. Um, I love seeing a lot of 12 personnel. You and I were just talking about how we want to see both tight ends on the field. And while Luke Musgrave only had, you know, one catch for three yards, he, there was a lot of, two tight end sets in this game, but 85 is just like really standing out as a guy that is like an integral cog to this offense. Yeah. And I mean, I think one of the, the players that is really exciting is Emmanuel Wilson and we've seen Josh Jacobs. Like we know who he can be. He had 14 attempts, which is kind of surprising, kind of low, but you know, we saw a lot of those get stuffed early in the first half. Didn't really get things cooking until the second half, but Emmanuel Wilson mm -hmm. had 12 attempts. So to only have two less carries than Josh Jacobs, I just thought that was, you know, really interesting. Obviously at his first career touchdown, which was really exciting for him. Um, but we weren't sure, you know, what this running back room would look like. Obviously Aaron Jones is a Viking AJ Dillon on season ending IR. It, we didn't know Marshawn Lloyd, we thought was probably going to be, RB2 and then now he goes on IR so as fun as Emmanuel Wilson's preseason was you know it was against second and third stringers so to see him yeah. having the success that he's having in you know against first team defenses has been really cool and I think he's deserving of more snaps and it, it's nice to see him as a change of pace back behind Josh Jacobs knowing he could be successful because Unfortunately, you know, that was one of the complaints last year was when AJ Dillon had to take over and be the lead guy, he struggled. So it's nice to have almost yeah. interchangeable backs at this point that whoever is out there, you can trust to pick up some tough yards, get you a first down and keep the chains moving. Yeah, because you don't, I mean, look, you know that Josh Jacobs is an every down back. You can have him out there, but you don't want that. You you don't want him to be playing all the time. You don't want his legs to be getting tired. You want him to stay fresh. So uh, yes, a hundred percent to your point, the fact that you can put Emmanuel Wilson out there, he can churn out, you know, 
50 yards on 12 carries and you can rotate the two of them and have like a really nice day on the ground without wearing down your RB one is huge. Yeah. I mean, the two of them combined for 93 yards, which like not insane in the run game when you think about what Malik Willis put on the ground, but yeah, just Mm -hmm. we knew that it was going to be tough sledding against this Titans run defense. And it was for the bulk of the game until they kind of opened things up in the second half. And um, I think that's also a testament, you know, to Malik Willis in the passing game, kind of making them respect the pass enough that they can't stack the box against the run, but just a, a really fun tandem early to be able to, like you said, be interchangeable and still have the success that they're out there. It's it's nice to not be like, oh, great, here he comes, stuff for one. You know, like you always expect success when either of those backs are out there. Yeah. And like the 93 yards was just enough. It, yeah. was, it was just enough to keep the offense like moving at the pace that they needed to, to be in rhythm, to open up the pass plays that Malik needed to, to move the chains, to get them to 30 points, right? To keep the Titans defense on their toes And like you said, not stack the box, not get the Packers offense one dimensional. I want your thoughts on inside linebackers. And I I don't want this to sound like hot takey or controversial or like I'm calling for anyone's job. But I think that I might be most comfortable with a McDuffie and Cooper tandem at this point. Because I think Quay Walker is so good at getting after the quarterback and going downhill and I like he has the ability to be a thumper but I think when he has to read and react it's a little bit tricky right now and I think some of those opportunities you'd want to see like I don't know if Hopper's gonna like I don't know what Hopper's playing right now it feels like he's never on defense and we haven't seen a ton of Wilson but it's been a lot of McDuffie and I thought McDuffie has played pretty well you know, to start the season, except for, of course, the wheel route to Saquon Barkley in week one. Otherwise, I thought he's had, you know, a good game. So I'm just just curious your thoughts on the inside linebackers in general, because obviously we talked about all of them getting in there for some pressures on Will Levis and, you know, how Halfley's utilizing them. They all kind of have a role, but I'm curious if we're going to see them start to mix up, like, which two are out there at any given time. Yeah, I mean, Quay's definitely having a little bit of a rough start to the season. Um, But I don't know if I love McDuffie out there more either. Like he's there. The reason for the Titans first touchdown. Um, I don't know if he was maybe expecting help on the back end, but I don't like, I don't love McDuffie in coverage either. Quite frankly. Like I think also McDuffie is great when he's, tackling downhill as well. Um, So I think he's doing it better than Quay right now, um, for sure. Uh, Eventually, I want to see more Edge Cooper because everything that we've seen so far has been phenomenal, but maybe that's because he's only playing in small doses, and so they're only asking him for small assignments. Like, I don't know what that picture would look like if it was fuller. Well, only – no, if we find out, but, um, I just, I don't know if I want more Isaiah McDuffie in coverage, um, which is, fa- I think is, well, and I don't know statement. if it has to be McDuffie in coverage. I just, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I want to see he's Cooper. so good. When he's, you know, shooting gaps, tackling downhill, um, you know, being a little bit more of that type of inside linebacker. I think, unfortunately, we actually just don't have. That's what I was going to say. Then who's your coverage linebacker? Better, <laughs> yeah, better better than Quay is right now, which is a little bit unfortunate. Um, I don't know. I, I, don't, I know. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's not the best spot. Um, Quay flashes, but he's so inconsistent still. Yeah, um, and but I, I, I don't know what Edge Cooper would look like in that situation. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's what's that's what's so challenging is that's kind of what Jeff Halfley is going to have to figure out because we wanted to see pressure and we saw a ton of pressure. And his secondary is, you know, they lead the league in turnovers. They had seven all of last season, and what are they at now? Like eight picks, nine picks, 
So yeah. it's it's just it's really impressive what he's been able to do already. But I, I'm curious if he starts shuffling personnel a little bit more or if they just ride it out because, you know, it's not like the Titans are world beaters, but they're still holding teams under 14 points. And when you do that, you win games. So like it's a, it's a liability against a team like the Eagles. And well, I think I think the test is really going to be next week against the Vikings and not to get ahead of ourselves, oh, okay. but they've got a very good running back coming to town and really a strong wide receiving core. So that'll be, uh, I'll be interested to see the the personnel that, uh, that Jeff Halfley trots out. I'm definitely interested to see it too. I think we're seeing a little bit more of like the creativity up front. So I don't know if that will trickle back at some point. Or if maybe he just doesn't necessarily trust the inside linebacking core and he's waiting for Cooper to get up to speed. There's a lot of questions there, for sure. I, I, they'll probably get answered as the season goes on. Because um, we saw a little bit of like the movement in the secondary, mm-hmm. right, in the first game. Um, I don't know if we would have saw... M- more of it if valentine was active today i think he's willing to make adjustments like I, i've yeah. seen halfley make tweaks in game and adjustments and personnel changes in game right he's moving definitely like the front enough that i think he will do that um it just might be i don't know if he has the tools in the box right now at inside linebacker yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think one of the uh, the last things that stood out to me, not necessarily a player in particular, um, but just the way that the Packers, it I don't know about you, but to me, it, it never really felt like after the first score that the game was in jeopardy. Like, I know the mm-hmm. Titans kind of came back, but it felt like the Packers had a really nice command of the game. We, you know, I thought maybe time of possession would be more lopsided and it wasn't, it was like 32 minutes to 28 minutes. So the Titans had ample opportunities. Neither of the teams really did amazingly on third down, both around 35% for conversion rates. Um, But just the, the amount of yardage that the Packers put up, obviously the turnover differential was huge. Field position was significant with the sacks. Daniel Whelan just remains, you know, a really electric player as a punter, which is, is a lot of fun to say, but the, the ability that he has to flip the field. Um, so just if they clean up some of the penalties, like a lot of the illegal formations and things that they should be able to, you know, kind of put that away. I feel like this is, it's a really fun offense now. And once we get to see Jordan love back, it's can't wait. Yeah. I, because you don't want any of those explosive plays called back in in another game against a more difficult opponent. You need those guards um, against the Titans. Like you could create those plays more easily. Um, but again, like next week against a Brian Flores defense, uh, it's not going to be as easy to create those big plays and you cannot be beating yourself and putting yourself backwards because of penalties. Um, I am excited to see Jordan back. It does seem like he is going to be playing against the Vikings, which is wonderful timing. Um, It's going to be interesting to see what they do. Um, I mean, we got one game of Jordan, so, and how he's going to look and how he's going to feel. And if they're going to have to make any adjustments because of his knee, you know, if he's a hundred, or if they're kind of putting him out there at like 95, 90, 85. So we'll monitor, I guess, over the course of the week. But um, that is a bit on the brain. Yeah. And I mean, I think it, it sounded like he was really, really close to mm-hmm. playing in Tennessee. And it seemed like he could have been a true game time decision. And I'm glad yeah. that he didn't play um, just because I, I think the extra week of rest is great. And just you know, why take unnecessary shots and unnecessary risks? And this was obviously a winnable game for the Packers without him. So, and I think, I I genuinely think that it can be a winnable game next week if he doesn't play with what we've seen from Matt LaFleur and how he's scheming the team open and what he's done with Malik Willis. Like, I'm not saying that if Jordan doesn't play, it's a wash, but you obviously want 
your star quarterback that you just paid a bunch of money to back out there for a divisional game. So we'll see, you know, what the week holds with him, but some promising signs. And I, I just don't think we can say enough that Malik Willis took this team to and O in his, his time while we waited for Jordan love to get better. So really impressive. You know, we thought if it was four weeks, if it was six weeks, if he could just get him to 500 or close to it and, you know, give Jordan love the reins when he was healthy, what would happen. And instead of just, you know, handing him the reins after a close victory, it's been two really dominant wins and two really impressive yeah. offensive performances for Jordan to come back to with like a wide open playbook with a ton of different options, with a ton of looks now that they've put on tape, the defenses are going to have to plan for. So just a really, really impressive start to the season for Matt LaFleur in the offense and honestly the defense as well. This team rallies around themselves in a really unique and positive and special way. Mm -hmm. um, unlike other Packers teams in the past, like when adversity hits, uh, I think they – they just have such a nice like spin zone to it. Mm -hmm. They really um, move forward and like bounce back. Uh, and again, I think it's a, just like a testament to the guys that they have in the locker room and their attitudes, but also to Matt LaFleur and the coaching staff. I do want to ask, and it's only slightly in jest, but not totally. Like does Matt LaFleur, and it's early in the season, so – there's going to be recency bias and there's a long season left to happen. But like, does he get some credit, like some nod for what he just did with Malik Willis? Like when is Matt LaFleur going to get his, his flowers? I mean, I think Dan Orlovsky tweeted that he was a hell of a coach. Like, I think it's coming. And I think that, you know, the small sample size hopefully was enough to put him on like the larger radar that, hey, he's been doing this for the last, you know, four years. And now, you know, the rest of the league is finally catching up. But yeah, I mean, I think if the Packers finish as the contenders that we expect them to be, the, the NFC is wide open right now. The Niners just lost to the Rams, the Rams who have no offense mm -hmm. at this point, <laughs> you know, the Eagles. <laughs> finished against the saints and the saints now have a loss on their record. The Vikings being undefeated is I think probably honestly the biggest surprise. The lions are right in it with the Packers of two and one, the Cowboys lost again. So it's, it's wide open. And the Packers honestly with Matt LaFleur at the helm, I think have as good a shot as any to take the NFC. I really don't see a true front runner at this point. And yes, it's been three weeks, but it, it feels like things are really, you know, shaken out and everybody's right there in it. Yeah. Yeah. I just think like what he is able to do with a backup quarterback and like also with a guy who got cut by his former team, like didn't even make the backup job by the mm -hmm. team that drafted him. And then Malik looked like legitimately good. Like this wasn't just like, oh, let's just like run, run, run. And, you know, this was like we put the hands we put the ball in the hands of this guy and he made plays. Um, so I think at some point, hopefully Matt starts to get the credit that he deserves because it's always been, Oh, well he has Aaron Rodgers, and okay. Well, when he starts winning, it's like, well now, like, well, Jordan loves really good. And you know, eventually it's like, well, let's just actually talk about like what a good play caller and coach Matt LaFleur just like simply is regardless of who's under center. Um, regardless of who is under center, Matt LaFleur seems to do an exemplary, exemplary job at play calling. Yeah. And I think that's a good place to wrap it here. I know that uh, we talked pre-show, like the Fox broadcast had talked about quarterbacks and, and where they end up. And Malik Willis probably was not a good fit in Tennessee as much as we talk about, being the first overall pick or being a first round pick versus being a third round pick versus being, you know, Mr. Irrelevant, where you end up is, you know, is more important almost than where you get drafted as far as what round. Yes. And Malik Willis needed a Matt LaFleur. And you could argue that Sam Darnold, you know, comes in and needs a Kevin O'Connell. And it certainly helps when you have a Justin Jefferson to throw the ball to. But the situations that guys find themselves in and the, and the coaches that they're with, 
I feel for a guy like Bryce Young, you know, and I'm not saying he would go win Super Bowls if he was in Miami or somewhere else, but you don't know. And I think that's just so telling. We're seeing Justin Fields have some su- some success with the Steelers now. They're three and zero, which is a surprise in the AFC. Caleb Williams, I thought looked really good. We'll see. It seems like they're trying to set him up for success, but it really matters what your coach is able to do. And I think that's also yeah. a testament to Matt Lafleur to say we can see what you're good at and we can see what you need to work on, but we believe that you have all the traits that we want to mold into a backup. You know, we all kind of scoffed when they said Malik is going to come in and be QB two. We were like, okay, he's kind of a project. Like, are we sure? And sure enough, week two, he comes out, wins two games and we're like, okay, we get it. We see the vision. Yeah. And that that's huge. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think you said it perfectly. I don't, I don't have anything to add. Um, well said Maggie. It's, yeah. Um, this has been a really, it was a fun game. It was a fun win. I'm really excited for next week. Um, we'll be back with our preview show. It's a first division game of the season. So always, um, always a crazy one. Those first division matchups, um, plenty, plenty to talk about. Um, I'm already, it's already going to be difficult and emotional yeah there's three <laughs> always some weird things that happen in the first divisional games of the season not a ton of tape on your opponents even though they're familiar always you know some weird things that shake out especially when the Packers play the Vikings it feels like there's always just chaos in those games but thank you as always for listening enjoy your victory Monday enjoy a victory Tuesday if you want you know let this let this win sit for a while because the Packers are two and one right in the thick of things in the division and in the NFC it's early but it's fun and Jordan Love should be coming back soon Um, so take it and cherish that we will be back like Perry said obviously this week to talk about Packers Vikings gonna be a really good one hopefully but either way we'll be here Find the show on Twitter at PWSS Podcast, Perry at Perry underscore Goldstein, me at Maggie J. Loney. Remember, you can find the show on Spotify and support it if you love what we're doing on YouTube. Please continue to like and subscribe if you watch us that way. But thanks, as always, for checking out the show and go Pack Go. Go Pack Go.